like to ask you to remain as you are. Normally for a talk like this, you'd have the option to face the speaker if you wish, but I'd like us to remain in Zazen posture. So let's take a moment to check in with ourselves. We're going back to basics this morning. Check in with your whole body. Notice whether you're relaxed or not. Notice where you're holding tension. If you need to shimmy a little bit, you need to let it all go. Take a moment to do that. It's important to be comfortable. It's important to be loose. And when you're ready, you relax, you're feeling good, you're feeling all right. Take a conscious breath, a nice in breath through your nose if you can. Connect with your lower abdomen, and uh, the Japanese word that we use here in Zen is hara, or tanden, if you will, place from which the deepest breath comes. Let your breath come from that space. Let it be long or short, however it is. Then watch it turn around into the exhale, and let it go, naturally, without forcing it. Just be right here for a moment. And you don't have to follow my lead, but when you're ready, take in another breath. Draw it up. Let it come from deep inside that space, that hara. All the way up. Take what you need and then let it all go. And keep going. I encourage this. Breathing is nice. As you follow your breath, connect with your hara, your pelvic floor, your sit bones. Feel that connection to the earth. That common connection that we all share. This is really it. This is life itself. This is life energy flowing and flowing. It's pretty beautiful, isn't it? I could stop here and say nothing more. And on any other given Sunday, I wouldn't even have said word one. We probably should have just done that. But as I've been called upon to speak to a uh, speak to you this morning. I think I'll continue, say a little bit more. I'll pick up my metaphorical banjo over here and just be a little whisper in the corner of your mind, but let your focus be on your breath. But incorporate everything that's going on into the fullness of your attention. Because this is really what we're doing here in Zen practice. It's really what we're doing here as living, breathing human beings. We're creating space. Now, as you breathe, notice that spaciousness that's created inside, this clearing out of anything that is unnecessary. Now, physically, we might experience this as a kind of like a deflation, like a balloon, or uh, something of that effect. But the more you breathe and really pay attention to that breath, you'll notice that that spaciousness, whether on the in-breath or the out-breath, it never goes away. If anything, it's magnified. And this spaciousness is capable of holding everything and holding anything, taking into account, acknowledging whatever is coming up inside, the thoughts, the fixations, the desires, the cravings, on and on and on, the whole of the human experience. This is being held in the palm of the Buddha. We're here creating space together, as we would any given Sunday, any given day that the temple is open. But really, anytime 
that we drop in and are fully here and fully with it. And we notice in this spaciousness that things are passing through. All of those things that we hold drop away. We can choose to let them drop away, create more space, allow more inside, and allow it all to go again. Really, we don't have to do anything. This is just the fundamental reality. Things are always just passing through. We are always just passing through. I said at the beginning that we're going back to basics. And I have written down in my notes that we all have some experience with Zazen seated meditation, but uh, there are a number of faces here that I don't know, so maybe that's not the case. Maybe this is your first time really delving into this practice, which, if I may say, you chose the wrong day, if that's the case. <laughs> but this is really the most fundamental thing of all. The breath is the most natural thing of all, and it's something that we don't even think about most of the time. The breath just breathes itself on its own. And so in that way, our bodies are always trying to wake us up. There is something in us physically, organically, that wants to wake up. And even more than that, we are already awake. And we are always being pointed back to that fact. So when we're sitting here, again, nothing needs to be said. All these words I'm speaking now are completely superfluous. All we're doing, all we have to do, again and again, is just return to this fundamental reality of who we really are. Letting things pass through without attaching to anything or applying any kind of judgment. Easier said than done, much of the time. But that's why it's a practice. We have to make that effort. Make that effort to remember again that we are all fundamentally already awake and there is nothing that we really have to do. It's a fun little paradox. Welcome to Zen practice. So this awareness that we cultivate in Zazen really is it. And we get to taste it, well, hopefully at least for 30 to 45 minutes at a time while we're on the cushion. But, as we know, and I think all of us know very intimately, this awareness goes away. And the spaciousness fills up. And eventually, over time, it can bottleneck. Things come in and come in and come in, and we lose sight of that spaciousness. We lose that ability to breathe and dwell in that spaciousness. And things just start to crowd around. Not everything can fit in that spaciousness. And so what happens? There's a splitting. Suddenly there's an inside and an outside. There's a distance that's created between you and me, between this and that. And to me, I tend to experience this, I say gap or distance. For me, I tend to experience it as kind of a wall that's created between us people, that's created between myself and a given task. It's just something that I've noticed in my own practice over the years. Um, I think more than ever, um, the further along I go into this uh, interesting little journey, which maybe doesn't say a lot about my own practice. But there is for me, the more I notice my attention slipping away, the spaciousness crowding, and myself drifting off into the land of delusion, the more I experience this kind of inertia, this way that I have, I'm speaking I, myself, Muken, 
the way that I have of coming all the way up to something, whether it be a task or an emotion or something that makes me uncomfortable, it can be a thousand different things, come all the way up to it, and it is to me like peering through a transparent wall. I can see that I have to do something, but it's a really difficult thing to get myself to actually do it. And I've talked about this in other, other times I've been up here, but I'm really speaking very practically here. Um, reading a book is very difficult for me anymore. I find that even when I want to read something, it requires the greatest mental effort for me to actually make the transition between what I was doing before and actually picking up the book and engaging my consciousness to take in the words and do the task, have the experience. And it's in those moments where I have to stop and say, wait, where am I? Where is that space? And I realize I'm in a maze of my own making. There's walls on every side of me because I've lost that attention. I've become intoxicated by that feeling of going forward into one task or one state of circumstances, if you will, and just not really having to do anything more than that. It's an easy way of existing. I think we all know to some degree or another what I'm talking about. Our own subjective experiences of the breath and, of course, of our own lives. I mean, they're going to vary. But I'm talking about sensory experiences, um, anxieties and judgments, and, and again, tasks. Things that come up that we have to face and have to make the effort to go into actively. We have to make that choice with that determined effort to see what it's all about and to go through it, ride with it. And that requires space. It requires that we're able to dwell in that space that we create inside so we can see fundamentally there is no inside or outside. When we're fully with the task, when we fully become that investigation of whatever is troubling us, whatever is standing in our way. Everything just takes care of itself. So again, it's an interesting paradox because there is this requirement that we make the utmost effort to return again and again into that spaciousness, fearlessly. And yet, when we do that, all of a sudden, there's no problem. And there really is no effort because we've returned to who we are and we understand, if just for a moment. And just like the breath, it's a cycle. Again and again, we have to return to it. Even writing this talk is one such task for me that gives me trouble. I don't like to write things down. It's not my favorite thing. And I find that whenever I'm asked to do this, it takes me days to figure out what I want to say and how I want it to be organized and what the points are and all of that. It takes me days before I'm actually able to write anything down. It just makes me uncomfortable, for whatever reason, to put words in the paper and bring more refuse into this world. So I think my compromise to myself is that half my notes for this talk are written on a napkin <laughs> for easy disposal. But it takes a lot of mental effort for me. I have to make that conscious choice. I have to make the choice to be aware of the fact that this is necessary because if I don't write things down, the words may not come out and I'll be stumbling around. It'll be shambles, it'll be chaos. But if I write it out in exacting detail, well, that too is no good because then I'm just reading from a script and anything that might be valuable in what I have to say loses some of its zing, it becomes dead on the page. So it's writing the ragged edge of disaster 
But that again is why spaciousness is necessary. One has to be able to move and breathe in accord with whatever happens, with whatever is coming down the pipeline in a given day, in a given moment. And so thinking about this and really having a hell of a time trying to get things on the page, even if I had an idea of what I wanted to say, I'm reminded of something that William Burroughs said in one of his uh, lectures in the early 70s. One of the most relatable things I've ever heard. He said that the thing that daunts him more than anything about the writing process is the amount of bad writing that one must do in order to do any good writing. And for a man whose a large portion of his body of work is literally cutting up physical pages of writing and rearranging them into new works, that's quite something to say that that's a troubling thing and he must have thrown away a thousand pages easily at that point in his life. But good writing and bad writing, that's another transparent wall. I'm here, I need to get there. And I find that in those moments of paralysis where I'm looking at my distance between point A and point B, I'm realizing that what's really growing, the seeds that are growing in that distance, in that it's a different kind of space, right? The reason for that distinction is fear. And when you get down to it, I think most of the things that trouble us in one way or another, it really comes down to a different flavor of fear. Fear of not measuring up to the ideas that we have in our minds, certainly there's that. Um, I think also a fear of exhaustion, that I will reach a point where I'll have nothing left to give. And then what? Or fear of reaching an absolution, some kind of fixed reality about myself. I am capable of bad writing. Fact. Okay. And then what? I make all kinds of flimsy excuses for myself as to why I can't do this or that, or I'm having trouble with this or that. And again, it's the human condition. We all know this very well. But the point here is that in creating space that enables point A and point B to coexist and dissolve into one another, and we can recognize any activity as Dharma activity. And what that means is that point A cannot be separated from point B, the bad writing, the good writing, they exist, certainly. There, is, there are qualitative differences between different kinds of writing or different kinds of really any activity when we're talking about outcomes. Good and bad certainly exist. You can say that. But they are fundamentally the same thing because it's the process of working with those things, the process of moving through the difficulty, making the effort, having the courage to dwell within that uncertainty, and that uncertainty too is vast and limitless space. That's the wisdom of discovery. It's only by scaling that wall or running through the space, however you want to conceptualize it. It's only by doing the work that we can discover, I think, there's no work to be done. Things will take care of itself, of themselves. This talk will be written, and then come what may. Might be good, might be bad. It'll be what it is. This lunch, which Smells absolutely incredible. We're gonna have lunch in a little while. It'll be what it is. We have probably a lot more people here th this morning than we bargained for. We may or may not be able to feed anybody. 
and that's, that's fine. But we make the effort. And we find the courage when we let it all go. We don't let anything crowd our minds, crowd our hearts, crowd us into a state where we're confined into a certain definition of how things are. When we dwell in the fact of transience, things will come and things will go. And things will always change. And there's nothing to worry about. Not really. Now I can sit up here and give this talk and act like I really know what I'm talking about. As I hope is evident, I have as much trouble with this as anybody. Anybody. Our teachers are here. Okuto Osho and of course Chigan Roshi and Shinge Roshi and many others who uh, occupy some state of being a quote unquote senior student. We're all here because we've gone through it and we continue to go through it and can speak from the experience, if not necessarily of what one might call wisdom, at least from a standpoint of courage, being able to take a breath and if nothing else, just sit and breathe and let things be as they are and be vulnerable, knowing that when we do that, we don't have to exclude anything. And fundamentally, nothing is excluded from anything else. So again, letting that in-breath draw up, fill the hara with ki, with energy, and letting that breath, letting that space include everything that we experience inside. My voice, the presence of all of us in this room, the city sounds, the world. I'm getting to the point where I have to look at my napkin. It's difficult. Including all those things. And giving it all away again. If you're familiar with the Tibetan practice of Tonglen, you know that activity of, of breathing in the poison and the delusion and the bad energy, the bad vibes, and breathing out compassionate nen. That selfless activity, it's an, it's an incredible effort to breathe in the anger we might have towards somebody or the uncertainty we might have about our own abilities and breathe out compassion for ourselves, compassion for one another, recognizing that in this fundamental compassionate state, all those separations dissolve. It requires a great deal of effort. So again, we're here at the temple and we're practicing breathing, sitting silently, breathing out all those judgments, all those extraneous thoughts, being here for this moment, the breath, the room, the city, the universe, coming into being and dropping away over and over again. Returning to this one every single time. Recognizing there's nothing more to be done here. This is it. And because this is it, because there's nothing more to be done, we can go infinitely deeper. Not stopping where we think this is the end point but continuing and continuing and continuing again and again and again, over and over. Over and over.
Now, I haven't really written a conclusion for this talk. I don't think that one is really necessary. I think that two things that I'd like to conclude with. First of all, I would like to issue the challenge to all of us. We've all been breathing through this talk, holding that breath in our, the space of our attention. Can we continue that through to the end of this period of Zazen? Can we keep it going into our work activity, which we'll have right after Zazen? <coughs> Can we keep it going through lunch? And when we go out the door a little later into the rest of our day, can we resolve to keep expanding that space and allow it to contain a little more and a little more and clear it out and let it come back and live our lives inside of this spaciousness, being held in the palm of the Buddha <clears throat> and bringing that to everybody and everything that we encounter in our lives. Whether we're, we consider ourselves Buddhists or not, whatever our beliefs might be, our, our traditions might be, however it comes to us authentically, can we do that? I think I'd like to conclude by chanting Atta Deepa. This was the first thing that we chanted uh, in morning service, uh, just a little while ago. I think for me personally, it, it's the most important thing that we chant. We chant it in the Pali, but there is a translation in the Sutra book, which you might have seen. Certainly if you've been coming here for a little while, you've probably noticed it. I'd like for us to chant Atta Deepa. Um, I would ask uh, Jiki Jitsu san, you have the taku, if you would lead us in a round of Atta Deepa. Atta Deepa can be found in your sutra book on page two, if you'd like to reach and grab that. We'll uh, conclude with a round of Atta Deepa. We'll continue to dwell in this breath, in this space. Keep our hearts open, and again and again return to one. I don't think there's anything more that I could say that's more important than that.
Thank you very much.